thank you for that video. He is Jesus. So we're going to um, have our service today. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Those of you who are here in person and everyone online as well. We have a few announcements before praise and worship. There's a wisdom for men on not June 18th, but it'll be August. So that'll be in the fellowship hall. And then the ladies' morning out will be coming up the weekend after that. Are we ready to worship? Stand and join us. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He is risen, he is
This time we'll have Pastor Deb read the scriptures for today in Hebrews chapter 5. salvation for all who obey. Amen. We're going to have communion today. Those of you that are online, you want to prepare for communion. Does anybody need a communion cup? Okay, we need one up here. You do not have to be a church member, merely having accepted Christ into your life. And to let you know, we will all take them together, and you can start fiddling with the top one. Uh, there's a real thin one uh, cover that comes off, uh, and then if you break that, you will see the bread. And then as you peel back the second cover, uh, you will see the the uh, the cup. Maybe I should have done this earlier. I'm just giving people at home. Yes, please. I'm actually just giving people at home time to get ready. You would think I'd learned by now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Brian, for faith in me. He said, take a couple. You might need them. Okay, I've got it. I'm getting there. Ta-da. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one flesh. Can we have a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can partake in communion, partake and remember you, Lord Jesus, the body, the blood that you gave up for us, for sins, and you cleanse us, and we ask you into our life, and we're forgiven, and for now and for all of eternity, we thank you for that, and thank you that we get to celebrate that this morning, in Christ's name, amen. Also in 1 Corinthians 11, for I have received of the Lord, which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and sa said, Take ye eat in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes.
Praise God for forgiveness of sins and acceptance in the body of Christ. Amen? I have a surprise this morning. Uh, We have fruit of the Melchizedek ministry with us way back. By the way, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary of Melchizedek next month on the 10th. Would love to have the two of you. Way back when, when I didn't know anything about the biker world, I met a president of the Enforcers and that club. And we got to know each other, and Dingus accepted Christ as his Lord and his Savior. And his wife, Elaine, who's with us now, she accepted the Lord. And daughter, Cindy, she accepted the Lord. She's oh, Amen. Amen. And I can tell you all kinds of stories, but I won't. <clears throat> One I will tell you. Dingus and Elaine and Sherry and I rode our motorcycles up to Canandaigua, or Canandaigua Canada. And uh, while we were over there uh, sightseeing, we stopped at Kentucky Fried Chicken, and now we're riding back across the border. Now, I looked real nice and pretty. Dingus didn't look so nice and pretty. Uh, Dingus was a biker. I mean, he was, you know. And I'm thinking as we're going through line, I look nice and pretty. Dingus doesn't look. I want, you know, because they can harass you for no reason. We learned that, right, plenty of times. And uh, so I pull up first, and he says, what do you carry? What do you have on you? I said, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I've got a tin barrel uh, and uh, uh, some Pepsi. And he said, move on. And so Dingus pulls up, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, let us through. And he says, what do you have, Kentucky Fried Chicken? (laughs) And Dingus says, no, uh, I got potatoes. Uh, I got mashed potatoes and slaw. He said, Get out of here. And so they let us on through. And I never forgot that, you know, how, because uh, I was wondering if we were going to sweat a little bit there. But glad to have Elaine and Cindy and praise God for Jesus Christ in your life. All right, I'm going to be uh, referring to what Pastor Deb wrote, uh, read in Hebrews. And you need to understand that verse 8. Though he were a son, that's Jesus Christ, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. Now, popular days teaching in America is we learn obedience by how blessed we are. Well, that's not what Scripture says. And so there's obedience and suffering at the cross. See, the church of Christ was not established, the greater body of Christ, Uh, for sermons and songs. It was established for salvation, sacrifice, and service. And we need to have that priority of God's will in our life. And so everything starts at the cross in our lives. Now, there's life before the cross, there's Christ on the cross, and then there's life after the cross. Now, Christ understood what was happening. We're watching and we read the story afterwards and we know the death, burial, the resurrection, the new life, which also gives us everyone else new life. Now understanding that, it's all about the death and the resurrection. The death forgives us of our sin. The resurrection gives us the new life. With any trauma in our life, because the cross certainly was a uh, a trauma to Christ and all the believers at that time. There's life before the trauma, there's the trauma, and there's life after the trauma. At the trauma, you find your real life. When you come to Jesus and you realize He's forgiven me, one of the songs we sang, I remember walking the aisle, the altar, uh, dedicating my life to the Lord with that song. I, man, that took me back years ago. And all of a sudden there is a change. I realize Jesus, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ. So with trauma in your life, if you find the real yourself, And then you realize that everything you thought you owned was an illusion. You find your house, your money, your relationships, security, your health, your identity, your importance. It's all, it's all, it's all for naught. And only what's done for Christ shall last. Now, as we understand that in our life, we're blessed then there's a trauma, and it can be anything. Death of a loved one, it can be a, a, a divorce, it can be incarceration, it can be a cancer. It can, whatever the trauma is, 
then we experience a lot of wisdom and understanding that we're never going to get otherwise, and we continue with that a deeper and a more solid person in Christ. Scripture comes alive when we're searching for God when we need God. And then we understand how to apply that and encourage other people as they experience the same thing. So there's before the cross, on the cross, and after the cross. And as Scripture says, the clay can't say to the potter, why have you made me so? Why have you, you know, why have, has this happened in my life? What we do, we need to ask the maker, our creator, what's happening in our life, and now how are we going to learn and live because of it? And, so, and until you die to self, you're just playing Christianity. See, dying to self is a continual transformational condition until we see God. It will continue transforming us and the scriptures, the understanding that God has. Now, this is going to get into some heavy teaching, okay? I do not expect, nor do I want you to have these experiences. But we're talking about heavy Christ going to the cross was heavy. Everybody's following him. He's doing miracles. And all of a sudden, he's being crucified. He's going to be killed in a horrible way. And he looks out on the cross, and he's looking at all these people that followed him, and not one is standing up for him. Even his best friend, he said, I'll never deny you, denies him three times. And I wonder what Christ thought as he looked down the audience and he saw Peter. I wonder what Peter thought when he looked up and realized, I denied my friend. And I've watched him for three years. We've been transformed in miracle after miracle. And I, and I won't even say anything because they were afraid. There's fear and there's faith. And when you're on the cross, which is it? When you're before Christ on the cross. And then there is the burial and the resurrection, and he's alive again, which made the disciples alive again. And so when we understand that there's transformation at the cross, there's transformation during and after a trauma in your life, we look and realize Jesus understood every bit of that. Now this is heavy. Acknowledge the loss as a blessing in disguise. I, I read in this morning's comic, uh, uh, this girl says, we understand life by looking back, but we have to live life looking forward. Okay, we understand life by looking, oh, I, under, oh, that was, oh, I get it. But while we're here, we're looking forward in hope. And when Christ was on the cross, they're looking and back. Well, wait a minute. But when the re resurrection came, they're looking forward. So God never said it's going to be easy. God allows good and bad things to take place for the fulfillment of divine will in your life. Now, a lot of Christians today don't believe that, especially in America. God allows good and bad in your life. Jesus said, I don't come to give death, I come to give life and life abundantly. And the thief steals, kills, and destroys, but not me, I give you. And we can believe that that perfect doctrine in an imperfect world. And so when we realize God allows that, now I've never understood that theologically, we will on the day of eternity. But His divine will will be performed in our life if, in, if and as we surrender to Him. And so we teach a perfect doctrine in an imperfect world, and surprise, surprise, Christian, it doesn't always work. Stand on it, confess it until you're blue, until you pass out. It does not always work. But His divine will is that Scripture to work in your life. And so what happens, we end up dying to self or our understanding at the moment. We crucify the old flesh or the old man and the fleshly desires and realize that hell and destruction are never full nor the eyes of man ever satisfied. Always denying the flesh. I had to deny the flesh last couple of weeks. They have a new... Uh, <laughs> 
Elaine, you'll love this. They have a new 2022 uh, OVC motorcycle, the 117 cubic inch, and I found one that's green with black flames. Melchizedek, right? A sign from God. Now it starts at 41,000. Uh, if you can find one, they're about 51,000. And I'm trying to finagle. I'm trying to think of all the ways God. Now, if I trade mine in, which I knew God gave me, and I, you and I, and for about, and so finally I thought, I'm just going to go up and ask. And I thought, I'm going to buy. And he said, you can't get them anymore. They're only made so many, and each, each company got so many, and, and they don't, I, not, not a green and a black one left. No, you can't get the OVC, uh, uh, OVCs anymore at all. Well, there's an answer. I go, ha, ah, but I don't get my new motorcycle. You know, it never stops. Doesn't matter what you get, there's one nicer. Doesn't matter what car you've got, you pull in, there's one nicer. It doesn't matter. Hell and destruction are never full, nor the eyes of man ever satisfied. We always want more. And behind that is because there's always more of God. And that's what we're really looking for is more of God. So God allows both good and bad to happen. And we die to self. We crucify the flesh. And now we live by the faith of the Son of God. Now listen to Philippians 2. For His good pleasure, for it is God's work in you to both to do and His good pleasure. And He knows how much you can handle. He knows how much testing you can handle. He know, you know, there's a lie we all say, and, and we, we've all heard it. Uh, God only gives you so much that, you know, only gives you what you can handle. That's a lie, people. That's a lie. Hello? That's, not, that's a lie. God gives you more than you can handle, so you'll find Him. So you'll realize He's there. He's in the middle of it. And so don't say that anymore. See, there is an addition for every removal. We're talking about why God moves people out of your life and other people into your life. I covered that uh, this morning in Sunday school. And when we look and realize that Jesus was born to go to the cross, to go to the grave and resurrection, I want you to stop and think when the angel appeared to Joseph and Mary. Now stop and think, okay? No children, right? An angel appears. Now, mothers, women, you'll really get this. Guys kind of get it. You're going to have a child. You're going to have a baby. I mean, everybody like when you find out you're pregnant, you, if, you want to tell everybody. It's going to be the most beautiful baby there ever was. I never forget Mark and Mary had three boys and finally a girl. What's her name? And what, you know, and what are your hopes? Well, she's not going to date until she's 33. But until then, she's going to get everything she wants. Why, this is this hope, this baby. Joseph and Mary, an angels appeared to Joseph and Mary and said, We're going to get, I'm, you're going to have a baby. And he's going to be the Savior of the world. He's going to do mighty miracles. And, and, and the world's going to flock to him. And he's going to start this whole movement of, of relationship with God. And they're going, what? Wow, wow, wow. And can you imagine Mary and Joseph hugging each other? Wow, and his name's going to be Jesus. Wow, uh, and he's going to be crucified. Eek. What? All the hope, I mean, if they didn't know that. And so you have the life, you have the crucifixion, the trauma, and then you have the death, burial, and resurrection following. Now, here's where I start applying this, and this is heavy. The comment was, for every, for, there is an addition for every removal. Okay, so the disciples, Jesus was removed, but look, he sent us the Holy Spirit, and later all the disciples were executed, were killed, but we, the world gained the gospel of Christ, and in my life, I'm looking back, see, now today I'm talking about the, your lifespan with God, okay? Your lifespan with God. And so I look back at life, and God knew when I was born, and God knew when Sherry and I got married, and God knew that eek, she was going to be killed, and then we're going to continue, and 
have this different salvation of different people. But with every removal, there's an addition. And so God knew when he called us to Geneva that there is going to be a death but he also knew at the same time Kathy's husband Jerry was going to die and she was going to understand. And so with a removal, there was an addition. God knew that when he called us here. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. Robert Schuller, the founder of Crystal Cathedral in California, I was listening to him years ago, and he said, you can't be a good pastor until you've had your heart broken because he was, his daughter's leg was amputated and he was going through this grief. And, and then he explained that. He said, because then you learn grief. Then you learn loss. And you become more sensitive and kind. And you become more understanding. And you look at the situation with the heart of Christ, not through the eyes of the flesh. And so when I looked at that, or, and look at that in my life, I realized that with the call that God had in my life, he knew back with Kansas City and the churches, he knew when he gave me the call to come to Geneva, that was before the trauma. And so we left the church there, we came up here, started the church, found all of you good people. Uh, not only that, if I could have looked ahead, he could have said, you're going to have the, one of the nicest buildings in the area, one of the most beautiful. Your wife's going to run the, and own the only Christian bookstore in town. You're going to have the Christian school, kindergarten through uh, uh, eighth grade. And, and we would just say, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, this is good. And by the way, uh, Dingerson Lane, they fit in there too, you know. Oh, hallelujah, saving souls in the biker world. Okay. Oh, and by the way, uh, your wife's going to be killed. And then there's this, all of a sudden, this doesn't, this isn't, all of a sudden, what? Uh, and, and then he takes me through that grief and through that understanding, and who does he bring into my life but my wife, Kathy, who's just experienced the same thing with her husband, and now we both understand, and he brings us together and multiplies the wisdom of grief and loss because we've been there. And so we have the trauma, the death of both of our spouses. But afterwards, we understand and we start ministering to people that when God brings us together, there's a revelation we understand. And we had a new understanding, a new strength. Uh, we understood grief. And we started teaching spouse groups. We started teaching at hospice. We started comforting people. And on their hospice deathbeds, leading hundreds to the Lord, hundreds to the Lord. I've led more people to the Lord in hospice than I ever will from the pulpit. Hundreds to, on the deathbed. Now, people, all of you catch this. My wife just tested it. Jewish brother-in-law, didn't want to hear any. That's your God, that's your Bible, that's your, didn't want to hear anything until he was on his deathbed. Catch this, people. On their deathbed, all their thoughts and beliefs go out the window because their soul shrinks and their, their mind, emotion, will, and their spirit increases because of the grace of God and they want to be right with God. I've led every type person of faith, any faith, agnostics, atheists, you name it, to Jesus on their deathbed. They don't want to, de don't go debating and don't go saying, well, I believe that. No. Do you want to ask Jesus into your life right now? Just go right to the point. <laughs> Kathy went down and she wasn't sure about leading a Jew with his attitude to the Lord. And she said, can I pray for you? And he said, yes. That surprised her when she asked Christ into, and then she comes back in the room in a, a couple hours and, and, uh, 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 can I, I pray for you? Of course, and holds a hand up. To, uh, All of a sudden, there's a change in relationship to God. He's in eternity now. Because on his deathbed, Kathy said, can I pray that Jesus would come into your life? Just ask the question. Don't debate. Don't explain. Don't get it in the Bible and go through all the chapters. Don't go through the Roman road to salvation. Just say, can I ask Jesus to come into your life right now? That just wipes the slate clean. And they will say yeah, hundreds 
have said yes. And I'm talking about wicked witches. I'm talking about, you name it, murderers. I'm talking about two confessed murder. And now, you know, on their deathbed, people, your relative, your friend, somebody you don't even know, but somebody knows you're a Christian, would you go see them? Go see them, and during that time, say, can I ask Jesus to come into your life and help you right now? Be your Lord. And your... They will say yes. Out of hundreds, I counted five, five in 21 years that said no. So what happens after the trauma? Kathy and I start ministering to all these different groups, uh, and then God gives us this building to what? Bring in other churches so His body can come together. You know, we've had six churches here. Two have already left and built their own locations because they started here. There's one pastor I hadn't seen for a couple of years. Kathy and I are over at the hospital a few months ago, uh, and I turned the corner, and here he is. And Pastor Mark, and he grabs me and gives me a big, I mean, a big guy, and he's shaking me, you know. And he's so happy to see me. Why? Because we let him start his church here, and it blossomed. It took root, and that's what this building is for, not only for for the Christians that are here. But besides that, then we understand the grief and we start teaching. We've written books about it, this new building for other people. Why? Because we understood loss and we understood how to bless people, to say nothing about the biker world. Uh, and I can't even tell you because we're online uh, what's happening there. God has given us a ministry, now catch this, that no other pastor in America has. I can prove it. I know it. I've been there. I am there. God has blessed the Melchizedek. Here's fruit. Years later, here's fruit of the ministry. And there's a lot more out there. That's why God has called. So I've thought about it. My wife has said different times, what would you do if you had it to do all over again? <laughs> oh, I said, don't even start. Don't even go there. But, but stop and think. Joseph and Mary, you're going to have this beautiful baby, Savior of the world, of course, of course. Eek! But I'm going to have him killed. Would you do it? How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you would say, yeah, give me a baby, I'll let you kill him? Your baby? But afterwards, there's a resurrection. See, how many of you say, would you do it? And I look back now, Hindsight, you can, uh, looking back, you can understand life. Looking forward, you walk in hope. Now looking back, <laughs> would I do it? Well, I think Elaine and Cynthia want me to do it. <laughs> what, what, what I... <laughs> <laughs> I realized it was you. I, I thought, I, <laughs> I thought, I'm never going to get through this. You know, the, the friendship we made in, in uh, Elaine and Sherry and me and Dingus and, you know, the understanding. I mean, he knew the biker world. He taught me so much. He, you know, he just opened it up. They're saved because of that. Would you do it? Jesus did. But you look after, now listen, you die to self, there's resurrection. There's resurrection, the power to lead others to Jesus. And people, that's a challenge. The challenge for the Christian church today isn't to name it, claim it, and get rich. It's not. It's not about getting stuff except saving souls. Every one of you, when you ask Christ into your life, you're accountable before God to share the gospel, and to save souls. So, would you do it? Yes, of course, because of the resurrection. So you die to self, you're alive in Him. See, is the end worth the beginning? When you look back and you say, it's worth it, here's, here's some evidence, not counting all the others, is it worth it? Christ thought so when He died on the cross for you, and when He died on the cross for all of us, and so die to self, share Jesus. And I, and I just really want to put that out. Remember this for, for years to come. If you don't remember anything else about this message. When somebody's 
on their deathbed. Don't ask, do you believe in God? Don't ask, are you a Catholic? Are you a Protestant? Are you a Christian? Don't ask it. None of that counts. Can I pray that Jesus would come into your life and show you how much he loves you? And they will say yes. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us on the cross so many years ago. And then you accept us because we ask you into our lives. So Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all the salvation here today. Lord, to cast off the flesh, to cast off the limitations of religion, the condemnation, the conviction. You, life and life everlasting, Jesus, are free to work in every life here, in every family here, and in this church. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. While we turned away from him, he turned his heart toward us. While we chased after selfish desires, he chased after us. While we made excuses for our misguided choices, pursuing an elusive sense of fulfillment, he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. This unthinkable inequity our Creator clothed in flesh and weakness for the sake of those clothed in iniquity. While we were lost and alone, He became a path for us. While we embraced the comfort of falsehood, He embraced us and showed us truth. While we were eclipsed in shadow, our spirits broken and dying, He became life and light to all. Our shepherd, our teacher, our savior and king. And when it seemed the world had given up, he gave up everything. At just the right time, when we were powerless, he displayed his power and purpose. While we stood accused, he accepted the accusation. He endured humiliation and the untold suffering of crucifixion. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, far from it, but because there has never been a greater love than the love of Jesus. Today, if you feel hopeless, He gives hope unconditionally. If you've been rejected, He accepts you completely. If your burdens weigh heavy, lay your fears and failures at the foot of the cross, for his blood has erased them entirely. No longer a slave, but an heir of salvation, you are his child, his chosen. You are his beloved.